Why use a self-direct denier? That is because when the proceeds come back, they come back into the account, not diminished by tax. Say you invest it, and here you get this big payout. Say it's $100,000 just because we're using that number today. $100,000 comes back in the account, that asset paid off. Well, if it went back into your checking account, you would owe tax, maybe capital gains and blah, blah, blah. Tax. If it's in an IRA, it's not going to be diminished by you. You can compound faster because more money can go back out into the next deal. And that's one of the best reasons for using a retirement account to it. Welcome to the Physicians and Properties Podcast. The show where we teach you how investing in real estate can give you the freedom to practice medicine and live life how you want. Doctor. 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 Now, here's your host, Dr. Alex Schlow. Hello, everyone. Dr. Alex Schlow here with another episode of the Physicians and Properties podcast. Did you know that you can use retirement funds, for example, your IRA, or your 401k. You can use your retirement savings to build your wealth outside of Wall Street. Do you know you can take those funds, that money, and invest in real estate or other alternative assets? That's with a self-directed IRA. Today, we talk all about self-directed IRAs. My friend, Karen Hall of Udirect IRA Services is on the podcast. She has extensive experience with self-directed IRAs. She's helped guide tens of thousands of Americans through the process of diversifying their investments and retirement funds. This is a great opportunity for you to take a big chunk of cash in retirement account and put it towards a great real estate deal or an incredible opportunity. Oftentimes, folks don't just have a significant amount of cash sitting around in a checking or a savings account. This can be a great way to tap into your retirement accounts and invest in the assets that you want to. For you to be able to direct and have that control, this episode was a masterclass in self-directed IRAs. I feel like I went back to school and learned so much. This was incredible. You are going to learn a lot about self-directed IRAs and the stuff that you learn here in this podcast can change your life and your family's life and just can impact you for generations to come. So without any further ado, let's get started with today's episode with Karen Hall, the CEO of Udirect IRA Services. Karen Hall, welcome to the Physicians and Properties podcast. I'm so glad to have you on the podcast tonight to talk all things about self-directed IRAs. How are you doing? How are things in sunny California? Oh, just beautiful. Gorgeous day today. Thanks so much. What's Colorado like? Well, it's been interesting, actually. The last few days, we've had just a lot of rain and really bad storms, which we do get the storms from time to time. But Colorado Springs, typically we get like 320 days of sunshine. And so it's been almost every day this week so far, we've had a pretty significant storm. My golden retriever does not love that. We don't love the fact that he sometimes pees in the house when it's thunderstorming. We were looking forward to the sunshine coming back. It's interesting. He used to never get anxious with storms, but we lived in Florida at Eglin, near Eglin Air Force Base in Destin, Florida. My wife is really afraid of tornadoes. And they were calling for some tornadoes right where we lived. She was pregnant at the time and she was really anxious. And all, the only kind of interior room we had with no windows was a closet, this like small closet, coat closet. So I remember my pregnant wife like dragging my golden retriever, Ollie, <laughs> into this closet. She's like, come on, come on, what are you going to do? And this is just a Coke closet. I just opened up a beer and I laid back on the recliner and I was like, I don't think that closet's going to make the difference. It didn't. Luckily, the tornado didn't hit us, but it did cause some significant damage about a mile away. But ever since then, Ollie, our golden retriever, has just not been a fan of storm. Luckily, all is good and not as many tornadoes here in Colorado. Thanks again for coming on the podcast. I know a lot of docs will benefit from this conversation. A lot of us have money in IRAs or retirement accounts. We feel like we're handcuffed and we don't really have the opportunities to utilize that or invest that how we want to. So I'm really excited for our discussion today. Before we jump into that, do you mind just telling folks a little bit about yourself? Sure. Actually, I was a radio announcer first. In my 20s in college for a while. I did that for a long time, actually. And then I got into real estate, like a lot of people start one thing and then you somehow wind up in real estate, like you, you're in medicine, you wind up in real estate. She makes money that way and have some nice financial future goals. So I did the same. I got a real estate license. I was a realtor for a year, managed some apartment buildings in Seattle and got to do soup to nuts on that one, even evicting people. So I learned a lot about property management and just went forward and, and I did mortgage loan servicing and then went into loan origination. I understood like the building and the structure and the laws and the rules of real estate. I spent a lot of time in the financing part of real estate. 
and the documents of what they're called and how it works and how you record them and what you do. It's just a really great education, I have to say, in real estate. In 2007, I started working for a self-directed IRA company. And a couple of years later, I went out on my own. I am the founder of Udirect IRA Services. So 15 years now. That is awesome. Congratulations. What a cool story and journey and a lot of experience in real estate from all kinds of different avenues to just really understand the benefits and the cons. It sounds like with some property management experience yeah. of real estate investing and, and then now your own business, uh, which is doing very well based off all the feedback that I've heard from folks who use your services. You were highly recommended by multiple folks. So excited uh, to have the opportunity to, to dive a little bit more into what you direct IRA means and what you offer uh, to folks. Do you still invest in real estate at this point as well? Yeah, I do. In fact, I didn't for a while, I didn't have some properties. I said, well, I can't really talk about it if I don't just go invest in something. My son and his wife living in a small town in, in uh, Missouri, so I bought a couple of properties there. And boy, those things needed renovation. I just had so much fun doing it because it was just really total rentals. When the properties are that old, one of them had like four layers of flooring on it. New flooring, just no problem, put it right on top of the old flooring. It just worked, it'll be fine. But we cleared everything out and, and just made it all there. New windows, new each factory. So. Where in Missouri? Columbia, Missouri. I have some friends in Springfield. I spent some time in Springfield, but haven't spent much time in Missouri, but different parts of it. The Springfield area is beautiful. I drove out there from Colorado and it becomes a prettier drive as you get closer to Springfield. So in Missouri, any other properties that you own at this point? Well, my primary residence, but I have other yeah. assets. And you're in San Diego, correct? No, I'm north of there in Orange County. Is it better to be mistaken as San Diego or LA? Oh, I don't know. I don't care. A friend of mine, he was on LinkedIn, they, if you really lived in Orange yeah. County, they used to say you're in LA. So he started a force called WeBOC. And it's a great place to live. Newport Beach, it's beautiful, well taken care of, really nice part of the world. It's absolutely beautiful out there. One of my um, best friends, and I was in his wedding, we've been friends for a decade now. He was living in Oceanside. I used to go out and visit all the time, spend some time in Orange County and just all over. I remember one day in California, we were in San Diego. This was in December. We went surfing in the morning and then we went snowboarding at Big Bear in the afternoon. And it was just so cool. I'm like, where else in the world can you do this? <laughs> Let's talk about self-directed IRAs. Okay. What is a self-directed IRA? First off, what's an IRA? It's an individual retirement arrangement. It was created in 1975. Gerald Ford was the president then. He signed the ERISA laws into effect. So ERISA is an acronym, of course. Employment oh, yeah. Retirement Income Security Act. So in 1975, IRAs were created, and they're always self-directable from day one. So the IRS didn't say what you can put in there, just what you can't. At that time, they just said no life insurance contracts, no collectibles. That's it. Then you have the financial advisors and the, the large houses like a TD Ameritrade or what have you, or some you trade lots of big you know, financial firms. And they're all licensed to sell stocks, bonds, and mutual. They got a 763, a Series 6 license. Now, when you have those licenses, you can't sell alternative assets. The self directed IRA industry came into effect sort of out of necessity, probably about 50 years ago when IRAs were created. An IRA is a bucket that holds assets, but what makes that IRA self-directed is that you get to put alternative assets in. When you open an IRA with us, it's to invest in alternative assets. And that is another topic because there are a lot of things that are alternative. What are some of the more common alternative assets? Popular would be something like a syndication. Somebody's raising capital and they get approval by the SEC. It might be called a Reg A, Reg B, C, D offering could be called private equity, private placement, subscription, lots of different words for the same thing, but it's private stock. A lot of times okay. you're doing either an equity or a debt investment where you're investing typically in a building. A lot of times it's multifamily, could be commercial, could be even a mobile home park or something like that, but something big that you're not going to really just take down by yourself. It's a great thing. We have a couple investors in some residential assisted living properties that we own. That's what they did. They invested from their IRA, self-directed IRA, or at least one of them. Hopefully by the time this comes out, his has cleared because uh, that's closing soon. Really cool uh, opportunity. Some folks here listening are probably familiar with a traditional or Roth IRA and a self-directed IRA. What's the difference between the three of those simply for folks who don't get this at all? Because doctors, we get a lot of medical education. We don't get any financial education. I know you guys really need to take a class. That's what the podcast is for. Just understand that this is these are the types of IRAs. Like you said, traditional, Roth, there's a SEP, a simple, 
even a spousal IRA, you could have an inherited IRA if somebody dies and you're the beneficiary. Yeah, and you could have a solo 401k, which isn't an IRA, it's a 401k. So those are the kinds of accounts we offer. Now, are you going to take those accounts and invest them in the stock market or are you going to invest them in alternative assets? If you invest, use that vehicle for alternative assets and self-direct. But you can self-direct your SEP, which is a simplified employee pension. It means you're self-employed. You can have employees with that. It's a pretty cool IRA because it's a really high contribution limit compared to most. Like this year, $69,000 is the cap. Wow. The lesser of 25% of your income up to a cap of 69000 So that's a pretty cool IRA to have. If you're not self-employed, a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA are great. You can put seven, dollars $8,000 a year in there and just continue to build and build and build. Where a lot of people start their retirement journey is at what? You've got a 457 if you're in the military, you've got a 403B maybe, or if you're in the commercial world of business, a 401k. So you work somewhere, hey, do you want a 401k? Sure, you sign up. You don't even really know what you've invested in most of the time because you're busy doing your job and just living your life. But when you leave that job, you're going to have some money there and it's retirement dollars. So you can take those retirement dollars and move them over into a self-directed account if you wish and invest in alternative assets. Like you say, it's a senior living fund, very popular asset class with it. That's Silver tsunami and the baby boomers. Get- it's a, such a great opportunity. For example, we'll just use hypotheticals, but pretend I had a Roth IRA with $100,000 in it. Okay. Somebody came with me with the opportunity to invest in a syndication, um, and I want to do that through a self directed IRA. What would be next steps getting that money from that Roth IRA into a self directed IRA? Right. The first thing I think about is that if you're going to invest in the syndication, sometimes you have to be accredited. You have to qualify to be able to invest in something like that. Accreditation means that you have a certain net worth. You open an account, super easy. You transfer or roll the money over or contribute. And then you give us the investment document. It's a syndication. We're going to see the subscription agreement, possibly the private placement memorandum, because that's the subset docs of the contract. We're going to look at that and make sure the IRA is the investor, not you personally, uh, but the IRA is the investor. And so we're going to check it out. And we might even do a check to see if we know if maybe the asset sponsor has some criminal activity. We might do that for ourselves, for our own protection. But when it comes to a self-directed IRA, you're doing all the due diligence. It's, it's truly self-directed. So you're doing the due diligence. We're not going to tell you if it's good. It's really easy. The hard part is doing your due diligence on that asset. And I'd love to talk about that. I think that's a great thing to talk about. A lot of times doctors can get preyed upon because we do for the most part as a whole of a profession have pretty good incomes. And like I mentioned before, not a whole lot of financial intelligence, but it can be easy for folks to kind of take advantage of that situation. So yeah, would love any tips or tricks you have for due diligence. would love to hear that. One of the things you want to ask yourself is where did you hear about this opportunity? How did you hear? How did it come to you? Was it friends and family? You saw something on Facebook. It's, 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 how credible is the source? Then you want to take a look and see, well, what is the underlying asset? And you want to do your due diligence on that underlying asset. If it's a senior living facility, well, where is a senior living facility? Uh, what are its prospects in that area? In other words, if you put one here in Orange County, there's senior living everywhere. Is there demand for it? Is this a viable asset? But then what you can also do is check out the asset sponsor themselves. Because a lot of times when you're investing in this kind of syndication sort of an asset. If if you're going to have a fraud, it's going to be because of the asset sponsor that operates. You can go onto the uh, FINRA's website and there's something called broker check. And I love it because if somebody has a syndication, they had to get that approved by the SEC. You're going to find them on broker check and you can see, gosh, were they ever incarcerated? That would be good to know. We've had people get messed up with that. And if they had just even just Googled, just Google the name of the asset sponsor and the word fraud, what comes up? Simple, simple homework. Yeah. This isn't tough, but I think the real challenge, especially with private equity, is getting permission and making sure you do this up front to see audited financial. Because if it's a Ponzi scheme, and what that means, by the way, is somebody's got a fund going and they borrow money from over from here for this deal, and they're like robbing Peter to pay Paul, that's not okay. That's a Ponzi scheme. Or they're getting new investors, they're paying the old investors out with the new investor money. That is criminal activity. So you want to be able to look at this deal while it's going on and see audited financials. But let's take it one step further. When you're looking at those audited financials and it's got Acme CPA firm, call them. Hi, I'm looking at this offering. I see these audited financials. Did you do these? Because I've seen asset sponsors falsify the audited financials. It's people, don't be scared, but just be aware. 
Those are great practical tips. I tell folks when they're thinking about investing just in general, you're investing in the the sponsor or the operator just as much as you're investing. It's an opportunity and you have to make sure that your goals align and that opportunity aligns and, and the sponsor aligns as well. So you're right. You hit it, the nail on the head when you said it's people. There's good people, there's bad people. And we've all heard and read those stories of syndicators who are doing really shady things. It's just super unfortunate that folks who work so hard save up their money and have the courage to invest, then invest in one of these deals. And then probably forever are never going to be interested in investing in real estate and syndication again, even though there's a lot of good operators and uh, good opportunities there. So that's really great advice. Going back to kind of getting the account set up. So 100,000, I am accredited and I vetted the operator, our syndicator and the GP. What are the benefits of me using a self-directed IRA for real estate investing instead of just like writing a check for 100000 out of my savings account? That's a really, really stupid question because you're going to have to make a choice. If you see a great opportunity and you say, I want to take advantage of this opportunity, do I use my own personal money or do I use IRA money? Sometimes you don't have that choice. Sometimes you don't have an extra hundred k personally lying around. But again, if you've been working somewhere, you left that company, you've got an old retirement plan, you can roll over like $100,000, you can move over. It's already retirement dollars. If it's already retirement money, then you're saying, where do I want to put this retirement money back in the stock market or in an asset that I understand? That's a different decision. But a lot of times when you invest personally, especially in real estate, you get lots and lots of tax benefits and it can be great. It can be just really, really great for you tax wise. And just put the pencil to paper and just do some columns and just kind of give yourself a plus and minus kind of a little exercise there. You maybe you want to do this personally. Maybe you don't want to use retirement. But the thing of it is, if you already have the retirement money, and we all need to save for retirement, America has this huge, huge deficit between what we have and what we need to retire. It is no joke. So we all have to prep. It just depends on where your goals are at the time. Goals are definitely the foundation of anything. Got to figure that out for sure. I think I was reading, correct me if I'm wrong, that there's like $1 trillion in IRA accounts or something like that. The whole retirement pie in America, like 38 to $40 trillion of all retirement dollars in, in the United States. That's wild. That's mind boggling. was way off there. $1 trillion is still more money than I could ever fathom. Why do you think people just leave it in the Roth or traditional IRA or the 401k, you think it's just because it's just easy and simple and, and folks just want to like set it and forget it, or they just don't understand that self-directed IRAs are an option? Both. I mean, uh, like here, you're busy being a doctor and you have really important things to do. Oh, why? And by the way, you're a dad. Ignore the crib in the back and, it's for our newborn. And you're married. So you've had a lot of relationships, a lot of responsibilities to manage, but also your financial health is another thing to manage, just like you manage your physical health. A lot of times people ignore their health. I'm sure you know that. Yes. It's just another area of your life, another garden to tend. So for, you might want to say in your life. So a lot of people, yes, I didn't forget it like they do with their health, but it, it's something you definitely want to pay attention to because maybe you don't want to practice medicine your entire life. Maybe you want to do something else or find some different, maybe instead of just practicing medicine, you want to create this large company and have a lot of doctors working there or maybe some health center. You could just think for him. You could do something else. You need to be able to think about growing your wealth and how to do that. Back to your other question, why use a self-directed right. IRA? That is because when the proceeds come back, they come back into the account, not diminished by tax. Say you invested and here you get this big payout. Say it's $100,000 just because we're using that number today. $100,000 comes back in the account, that asset paid off. Well, if it went back into your checking account, you would owe tax, maybe capital gains and blah, blah, blah. Tax. If it's in an IRA, it's not going to be diminished by you. You can compound faster because more money can go back out into the next deal. And that's one of the best reasons for using a retirement account to the compounding. That's amazing. And the tax benefits of real estate as well, just in general, on top of that, you know. When it's in a retirement account, you're not going to get to depreciate. But it's two different worlds. And you know, we could go deep on them, but investing personally, investing with your retirement account, two little worlds of rules. What are some of the more common kind of risk or drawbacks of investing in real estate through a self-directed IRA? Or are there anything, any investments in particular that can't be held from a real estate perspective in a self-directed IRA? I think all real estate can be held in some form or another. Probably one of the biggest mistakes we see in real estate Whatever form it may be, by the way, your IRA could make a note and lend somebody money so they could go buy real estate. Or okay. your IRA could even make a mortgage for something. They're going to pay your IRA back that debt. Or you can buy the building or you can again syndicate all these different ways. But when you're 
looking at all these different ways uh, to invest in real estate. Now I'm trying to jump back on the train of thought because I'm looking at that crib. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. I kind of lost my train of thought. From a real estate perspective, like, are there any drawbacks? Correct me if I'm wrong, is you can't have any material participation in the deal. Like, I can't take my Roth IRA and put it in a self-directed IRA and then invest in an assisted living deal that I'm doing. Correct. Right. Now you're talking about a, a different area that we really, really need to touch on, rules of self-directed IRAs. They're weird because they don't exist elsewhere. <laughs> the self-directed IRA, you can't invest with a disallowed person. Let's be more specific. Your IRA doesn't do business with a disallowed person. It's your ascendants and descendants, your parents and grandparents, you and your spouse, children and grandchildren, plus any 50-50 business partner and a fiduciary like your CPA or maybe the realtor in the deal or something. Those are the disallowed parties. Your IRA doesn't make a loan to your wife to open a company. She's disallowed and a disallowed person would be receiving personal benefit. Now, your IRA doesn't buy a property from your parents or sell one to your kids like that. That doesn't happen. But also what you're talking about, like if you're the, a GP, you're doing what's called offering services. to the, And when you're offering, when you're that closely held, because you're probably getting personal benefit from that asset as the GP, you're getting paid for those investments. You're getting paid for your work. So you're getting personal benefit. But if you're the GP, you're too close to the deal. You always want to keep it arms you know, and stay away from disallowed people. But the exception is that disallowed people like you and your wife could take your IRAs and invest concurrently, as long as you record it on title at the same time. But then you could never buy each other out. You could never have personal use of the asset. If it's a house, you could never live there, or go there, stay for eat or eat. So keep it arm's length. And by the way, we do offer always a 20 minute free call. If you commit a prohibited transaction in your IRA, it's like a tax protected bubble. That bubble bursts. And now that money becomes taxable. It doesn't happen very often. I've been doing this 17 years. I've seen like half a dozen of these really blow up. That's given the thousands and thousands of accounts that I've worked with. That's just not very many. Mostly because a lot of sets of eyes are looking at it. You're looking at it. We're looking at it. If we see a prohibited transaction, we'll bring it to your attention. But the responsibility not to do it lies on the account. I guess that's the most important thing too. Just keep it arm's length. I love to say game of keep away. That's good. I think you, you mentioned something too. I just want to make sure that folks are aware of that you can't go buy like a short-term rental with your you know, wife's IRA funds and then stay there or manage it. So good to keep away. Cause I know folks have asked that question before of like, oh, well, can I just use this IRA to buy this beach house? I guess you could buy a beach house, but you can't ever go there. Not very fun. But what are some other specific or more common kind of rules or regulations that you feel like would be helpful for people to know who are, are starting to think about, hey, I have this $100,000 IRA that I want to put in some deals. You mentioned property management. So I think we should just finish that up, wrap that up. It could never pay your, your IRA could never pay you for doing it. Number one, you can screen the tenants. You can pick up and collect their rent checks made payable to the IRA. By the way, if you are ever investing retirement doll and the asset sponsor writes the check to you personally, don't cash it. That's a prohibited transaction. Just say, hey, asset sponsor, I need you to recut this check. Send it back. You don't cash that. You can hire third-party vendors. So in, in a sense, you can property manage, but you're just not going to swing the hammers or get paid full of some property managing. But in a lot of ways, you're hiring vendors to do that. That's really good practical advice. We just get that check written back to like Alex Lowe's IRA, self-directed IRA or whatever that may be is how you want those funds deposited. Exactly. That's probably one of the biggest uh, mistakes that asset sponsors will make. The second biggest is when you invest in a fund that maybe you've been in this fund and, and it paid off, there's a liquidity event, they've got a new fund. They want you invest, to invest in the new fund. The mistake that people that asset sponsors will make will think, oh, I'll just take the money that you invested with your IRA in this fund and just move it without telling the custodian. Then the custodian doesn't even know that this app that they have custody of this other asset. If you're going to move money from one fund to the next, first the first the first deal gets paid off completely, and then the okay. IRA disperses money into the second deal. Super important to know. That's really important to know. I would have just thought the opposite. So I'm glad that we're having this discussion. But going back to kind of the practical setting up an IRA. What are things that folks should look for in a custodian? What are some benefits of you direct IRA and kind of nuts and bolts of setting up that account cost, tax documents, those sorts of things that you think would be important for folks to know if they're thinking about getting started? In the past few years, things have gone digital. So we made the application <laughs> process so much easier. It's a digital form. So you fill out a digital form online. While you're doing that, we're going to be asking questions about where's the money? Where's your retirement money now? Are you moving retirement? 
if it's a transfer IRA to IRA, we're going to even start that process right as soon as you open the account. So you fill out the digital form, takes maybe 15 minutes because you probably have to go, oh, what's my account number? Go look it up and find it. But you get that account open and then immediately you've got access online to see your account. We're going to be walking you through. We've got staff that's going to hold your hands through the funding process, giving the money in now. For example, if you've got a previous employer's account, well, then it's not a transfer. You've got to contact that previous employer's plan administrator and get their paperwork, fill out their paperwork, and then they're going to cut a check to your retirement account that takes a little longer than an IRA to IRA transfer. But we're going to walk you through all that. That's what happens. And then the next step while we're waiting for the money to come over is perhaps you already have your deal and you already know what you want to invest. If that's the case, you give us the documentation. We call it the supporting documentation. It supports the investment. We're going to look at it and get it all queued up. We're going to make sure it's vested correctly in the name of the IRA and get it all queued up. Once the money is available, we can fund that. And now you've self-directed. So you open, fund, and then 100% of the proceeds due to the IRA come back to the IRA that owns the asset. And that's how it works. If there are any expenses of that asset, a lot of things that we're seeing now uh, include capital calls because the asset sponsors, GPs have had to restructure their debt. Maybe they had debt that came to term. Now they have to get new debt and it's at a higher rate. They didn't expect it. If there's a capital call, you need to have your IRA pay for that. That's why you need to leave idle cash, uninvested cash in your self-directed IRA to make up for shortfalls or expenses. Your IRA owns a house, for example. You don't like get a home equity loan on your own house to put the roof on. That would be or game over, you're not prohibited. What you do is you, you've got this reserve of idle cash and you can use that for any kind of repair that needs to happen. Good to know. So have a reserve account as well, kind of within the self-directed IRA. How long typically is kind of turnaround time, opening the account, getting it funded, investing into a deal? I guess kind of limited on how long it takes to get the money from the employer. But if we're doing like say a wire from or ACH or whatever, transfer from IRA to IRA, how fast could that be done for you? Well, the fastest in the industry, you know, because I belong to this industry group called RETA, the Retirement Industry Trust Association, we compare them. The fastest it's ever been done is four days from opening an account to funding a deal. But check has a mandatory 10-day hold. And when I heard that initially, I was, why? It's a check. It's clear. No, there's something called a clawback. Maybe Fidelity says, oh, guess what? We're going to claw back that money. If we get your money from Fidelity... You fund your deal, and then they decide to claw it back. Now we're on the hook for the money that we dispersed into your asset. Not a good business practice. There's still a clawback on an ease. The wires are okay. um, the best. Typically, here's the timeline. This is the answer you really want. You open an account. One day, the whole thing's done. Even 15 minutes, you can do the whole. Funding the account, either an IRA to IRA transfer, takes talks two weeks for the whole thing. The most you're really going to wait for an asset sponsor is two. Even if you're going to write a check and contribute, you give us the check, we deposit it, 10-day hold on checks, monies. So think two weeks from opening to funding your deal. A question I wish I asked in the beginning when you were talking about 401ks, are 401ks fair game to roll over into a self-directed IRA? Absolutely. Yes, okay. but let's talk about that. For a 401k, if you're still working at the company, you probably can't move that money. But there could be something called like a special clause. It's called an in-service transfer. If you're working there, you're in service, you have to ask the plan administrator, hey, is there an in-service transfer? And if they say yes, you know, great. Then you can move some money, usually not all of it, over into a self What about a thrift savings plan? That's what military has. Right. A TSP, you really have to wait until you leave service. Makes sense. Sorry, I meant to ask those earlier. I appreciate it. That's a great overview of kind of soup to nuts, how to get started, how to invest in kind of timeline we're looking for two weeks or so or less. How do you see the future of self-directed IRAs in real estate investing evolving? I think this is really starting to become something that's more known. As you mentioned, trillions of dollars are in IRA accounts. Where do you kind of see the future of self-directed IRAs going? I see it as a very strong future. And the reason I say that initially, I mean, the biggest reason is because of the bipartisan support both sides of the House and Senate are pro-retirement savings. Otherwise, the government's going to have to make up the shortfall. They're very pro whatever helps you save for retirement. So that, that's pretty good. But you mentioned real estate, but there are so many other asset costs. Besides, we mentioned notes. But you can even buy performing and non-performing debt. The bank can sell me a loan, say it's got $100,000 base value, and I pay $80,000 for it, but I have the right to collect a hundred. dollars Sometimes... Banks will do that because they want liquidity. They want the money. They'll sell an asset pennies on the dollar to get to get the cash. Same thing with tax liens. A taxing authority, like your county, like your property tax bill, 
they have the right to collect X number of dollars, but sometimes they might sell tax liens at a discount. So they have that money now. They're not borrowing it. They're just discounting the amount that's due. So your IRA can even invest in tax. That's another asset class. Cryptocurrency, which is the Wild West, not going to lie. There's some risk there. No question. Another very popular asset is precious metal, gold, silver, palladium, platinum. To be in an IRA, though, these metals have to have a super high fineness. And this is on our website. You go to udirectira.com and check it out. Super high degree of purity to go into an IRA. For example, a Krugerrand, you may have heard of this before. Uh, a Krug is a gold coin, but it doesn't have a high enough degree of purity to, to be able to be in an IRA. And then we would store those metals for you. They would be stored and custody so that you wouldn't have personal use of them. You don't have gold at home. Don't let anybody tell you you can. You don't put the gold at home. So those are other asset classes maybe you hadn't thought about. No, I, I have not. That's really interesting. Maybe within the real estate market, have you noticed a trend towards specific asset classes as you've been involved with more and more folks? Has it been largely multifamily, kind of self-storage, more commercial? Multifamily's had a long run. And I heard five years ago, oh, yeah. multifamily, it's just, you know, it's <laughs> exhausted. Well, it doesn't seem to be, does it? Everyone needs housing. Yeah, and and we need denser housing. But in California, we definitely have denser housing and we have building codes that are set that you can only build multifamily in some. So multifamily, I think, is always going to be a thing to some degree. Yes, it's very, very popular. The way you invest in it, though, the vehicle is usually a syndication. That's how you get into it. But again, think about all the different kinds of of property, like commercial, like a strip mall. Also, what about raw land? What about your IRA buys a parcel of land? Maybe then your IRA, it's just got the signs just sitting there, but maybe your IRA rents it out to a farmer to graze cattle in Colorado. Or maybe you're in California and you rent it out to somebody to put a windmill on there. You could rent the land to someone to use. So raw land, or maybe you just leave it for appreciation because they're not making any more of it. It's very true. Land investing definitely is a great asset class. We had a, a doc, Dr. Mamta Kumar on the podcast quite some time ago, done very well with land in Texas. And uh, yeah, it's definitely a great asset class. I want to be respectful of your time. I did want to hit on, if you don't mind, kind of what are some typical fees to expect with a self-directed IRA? Every IRA provider has different fees and different ways of charging fees. This is our way. We have a flat fee. It's $275 a year, regardless of the number of assets and regardless of their value. If you have a note, it's an extra hundred. Wow, that's a great deal. Yeah. Well, some companies have a sliding scale. So the more your account's worth, the more you pay. But it's no more work for us. If your (laughs) asset's a million or or 100,000, it's the same. We don't charge more for high dollar accounts. That's why Udirect is really good for high dollar accounts because we're not going to ding you for the value. Yeah. Our wire fee is uh, $15. Our fees are just really, really low. That's one of the, the great things. And our service is great. People just yeah. love our service. We have so many five-star reviews. You yeah. can check us out on Google. We have the occasional one-star review because not you're not going to make everybody happy. And also not everybody understands a self-directed IRA either. And they, they might have expectation about what it is and they may not, not understand what we do and what we don't do. We try to make it clear not able, everyone reads their email either. But just yep. to talk about fees, that's it's $50 set up fee, $275 a year. And we ask that you leave a minimum balance of $325 in the account. That's very cool. I definitely know that folks uh, listening to this, what are some great ways for f- folks to reach out to you? Of course, udirectira.com is a great resource. We'll put all the links in the show notes as well. But okay. if folks want to reach out to you, get on one of those free 20 minute calls and, and talk more about it, what are some good ways for folks to do that? The best way is, is hit us up, info at udirectira.com. But if you go on our website and you hit contact us, then you'll see a calendar. You can schedule an appointment at your convenience to meet with one of our helpful people who will answer all your questions. And once every other month, we have a self-directed IRA workshop too. It's just a random way to you can sign up for it. And the next one is in September. If you want to do that, you can. Otherwise, just call us and talk to us and we'll talk to you about whatever your question is. Do you feel like there's anything that we missed, anything that would be important before we wrap this up? Well, one thing to know is kind of like you mentioned, sort of like an eye to the future. Where is retirement going? So at the end of 2022, something called the Secure Act 2.0 is now, created some new rules which have yet to be implemented. One of those rules is that you can make a Roth type contribution to a separate simple IRA. What does that mean? We don't know. Could we have some guidance? No, it's only been two years, so we're not going to give you any guidance yet. What what I mean by Roth is that the money has already been taxed and it goes into your account, already has taxed dollars and grows tax-free for life. So Roth is the gold ring, the brass ring, whatever. That's what you want. You want Roth dollars because 
you're probably going to be paying the highest income tax rate of your life when you're in retirement. And the more tax-free dollars you can have, the better, less taxes, better, my opinion. Be looking for things like that on the horizon. Sounds like good things on the horizon for these IRAs. So excited for you and, and your business that you direct IRA. I'm excited to, to talk with you more because I'm sure hopefully I'll have some opportunities to roll over some IRA money. I need some deals here soon as well. So really looking forward to that. And we'll be sure to include all the links in the show notes. And folks that are listening to this, definitely reach out to you direct IRA and learn more about how you can use your IRA to benefit you going forward. It's been really great having you on the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Well, with that, it's been Karin and Dr. Alex Schlow with another episode of the Physicians and Properties Podcast. Signing off. Hey, real quick. If you're still listening to this, I'm assuming you got value from it. So I need your help specifically. My two-year vision with this podcast is to help 100,000 physicians learn how investing in real estate can give you the freedom to practice medicine and live life how you want. There are two main ways that a podcast grows. One is the ratings and reviews, and the other is word of mouth. If you can please leave me a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, as well as send this to one to two friends that you think would get value from it, we can reach the physicians that we want to reach. Thanks in advance, and talk to you on the next episode. Please note that the information shared on this podcast is for informational purposes only. It should not be considered financial or medical. The views expressed on this podcast are those of the host and the guests, and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Department of Defense or the United States Air Force.